Good morning. Have you noticed that the world we live in today doesn't really celebrate humility? In fact, too often athletes get recognized because of their confidence, which really is a lot of arrogance. And the athletes who make the most news are the really arrogant ones. But it's not just that. We see it in politics. You see arrogance in politics. I mean, after all, it takes a lot of arrogance for one person to say, you know, I think I'd make a good senator. Or I think I'd make a good president. That just takes a lot of arrogance, I think. But we see it in other places. We see arrogance everywhere in our world. Today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. And in Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes a lot about humility. Specifically, the example of humility that we have in Jesus. So we're going to start reading. This is Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was the, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, became, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I love this statement. If there is any encouragement in Christ... If there is any encouragement in Christ, this kind of reminds me a little bit of what we see in Mark chapter 9. Jesus has just come off the Mount of Transfiguration. And while he was up there, a father brought his son who had an evil spirit in him. And this father brought the son to the disciples that were left at the bottom of the mountain and said, Please, can you send this demon away? And they tried and they failed. And finally Jesus comes down the mountain and the father asks Jesus, Can, please do this. And Jesus says, well, what's wrong with the boy? And so the father tells him. And then at the very end, the father says, please, if you can help. And Jesus' response is, if? <laughs> and then he makes that statement. We all know all things are possible. Right? Right? Through faith, all things are possible for those who believe. And the Father says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. But I love that Jesus responds with, if? <laughs> if I can help? Of course I can help. Well, here Paul says, if there is any encouragement in Christ. <laughs> I think there's some encouragement in Christ. Don't you agree? There's a lot of encouragement in Christ if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, of course, we find all of those in Christ. And Paul is writing to people who know that we find all of those things in Christ. 
After all, he is our example. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that he was tempted in every way that we're tempted, but he was without sin. If that's not encouragement enough, then we can absolutely be encouraged by the way that he dealt with those who did fall into temptation, who gave in to their temptation. Just think about the way that Jesus dealt with the woman at the, the, with the woman caught in adultery. How much love he showed her, how much compassion he had for her. And then the woman at the well, knowing her life, knowing all that she had done, all she had been through, but he met her with compassion and love and grace. Of course, we can be encouraged by Christ. But we also know the comfort that love brings. And we know the affection and sympathy we receive from Christ because of our participation together in the Spirit and in the work of the church. You see, we see the love of Christ and we see the compassion of Christ through the church as well. And in a lot of ways we give the love and compassion that Christ gives to others. We should be treating each other with love and compassion and grace and mercy the same way that Christ treats us with those things. So because of all this, because we know of everything that we need to do, we need to be like-minded with Christ. We need to have the same love, sympathy, empathy that Christ has. And in this passage, we're going to look at four ways we can do that. Four things that we need to do to be more like Christ. The first one is we need to put others first. We need to serve others. And there is a difference between thinking of others and putting others first. So those are the first two then we need to sacrifice for others. And last but definitely not least, we need to give glory to God in all things. So let's explore these a little bit more together. Thinking of others first. Verses 3 through 6 here in Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What causes conflicts among us? Is it that we have different desires? No, different desires are good. But it's when we insist on our own way instead of compromise or instead of allowing others to have their way it's selfishness really if you get down to it i believe that selfishness is the root of all sin selfishness is the root of all sin when we consider others to be more significant than ourselves when we are humble and selfless that eliminates almost all sin. That eliminates so much. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. And although he is hungry and waiting for food, he takes time to talk with this woman. He takes the time. When you go to Jesus feeding the 5,000, do you remember why Jesus is where he's at? It says he was tired. And so he went out on a boat to find a place of solitude. He went to go rest. He went to go spend time with the Father. And he sees a crowd coming, and he has compassion on them. Did Jesus have the same needs that we have of rest and solitude? Absolutely. But he put other people's needs before his own. 
We need to think of others first. We need to remember that if Christ, being God, the creator of everything we know, if he was willing to put other people first, we can do the same. And more importantly, we need to do the same. And isn't it amazing that Jesus, the creator of everything, that when he was here on earth, he, didn't, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped? Verse 7, But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus served. Think of John chapter 13. Jesus takes the lowest position in a household. He washes their feet. And in the meantime, they're having this discussion of which of us will be greater. <laughs> which of us will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And their master is washing their feet. In Matthew chapter 20, a very similar discussion happens. Except in this case, in Matthew chapter 20, it's not the disciples saying who's going to be the greatest. It's the mother of James and John comes to Jesus. And she asks this question. When you come in your kingdom, will you let my boys sit at your right and at your left? And Jesus says, that's not for me to give. But then he says this to his disciples. He says, but Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be, will and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We need to be servants. We live in a world that needs servants. Whether it's picking up groceries for your elderly neighbor, whether it's making eye contact with someone in a grocery store and smiling because you can tell they've had a hard day, even though they can't see your smile through your mask, whether it's making a phone call to someone who is locked up in their house who can't get out, we need to be servants. And in serving, we need to make sacrifices. Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. A painful, humiliating sacrifice. If all you're willing to sacrifice is a couple hours a week to come sit in a parking lot in the church building when it's open. If that's all you're willing to sacrifice for Christ, I, I don't think you get it. I don't think you understand the scope of what it means to be a Christian. I don't think you understand what it means to be like Christ. Because we're not called just to come, sing a couple songs, listen to a sermon, maybe a couple prayers, drink some juice, eat some bread. That, that's not what the Christian life is about. It's about being like Christ. And that involves a lot of sacrifice. Jesus didn't wash a couple of feet and call it good. He didn't just feed a couple people and say, I'm good. He spent his life sacrificing himself to those around him. 
don't be confused. Christ didn't only make one sacrifice on the cross. He made a great, the most important sacrifice on the cross. But he sacrificed himself every day of his ministry. He sacrificed his needs. He sacrificed his wants, his desires. His life was a living sacrifice. And when all is said and done, he went to the cross. The ultimate, humiliating, painful sacrifice of the cross. So that begs the question, what are we willing to sacrifice? Again, I I don't believe it can just be an hour or two on a Sunday morning and maybe a Wednesday night. The sacrifice of being a Christian is not a one day a week sacrifice it's an everyday sacrifice always putting others before yourself now don't get me wrong that doesn't mean that you can't take time for yourself it's important that we do but it's more important that we sacrifice the way that Christ sacrificed so what is easy for you to sacrifice What's something easy you can do to sacrifice? Do that. Make an easy sacrifice first. And then start thinking of the more difficult sacrifices. Put extra time and prayer into working on what is hard for you to sacrifice. If we're going to be honest with ourselves, there is something that we need to sacrifice in our lives. That'll be hard to sacrifice. Work on it. And when you've done that, when you've lived a Christian life, when you've helped others, when you've served others, when you've sacrificed for others, when you've put their needs first, make sure to give the glory to God. And being like Christ, if you make that choice, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you make that choice, you will do great things. You will help people in amazing ways. And they will be so grateful. Give the glory to God. Don't take the credit. Don't inflate your ego. Be humble and acknowledge that you are just following the example of Christ. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John writes, We love actions, not emotions. We love because He first loved us. Actions, not just emotions. God doesn't just love us. It's, it, it's not just a feeling that God has for us. It's what He's done for us. He has shown His love for us in the sacrifice of his son. And we need to show God's love to others in the way we sacrifice ourselves for them. But we need to make sure that we give that glory to God. In all things, we need to be giving glory to God because it is God who gives us life and it is because of him that we can serve and we can sacrifice for those around us. Because of the great example in Christ that he has given to us. We need to put others first. We need to serve. We need to sacrifice. And we need to give glory to God. And I'll leave you with this. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. As humans, let's face it, we're not very smart. We forget a lot. At least I forget a lot. 
Think about those Christians that you look up to. What do you admire about them? Who is a role model for you that you look to? Whether they're living or if they've passed on. Who is, who was a role model for you? Think of them. Keep them in mind as you follow Christ's example. Run the race the best you can. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall down. Hopefully the church will be around to help you pick yourself up and carry on. If you see someone who has stumbled and fallen down, help pick them up with encouraging words. And no matter what the sacrifice is, remember the reward. Eternity with Christ. And through all of that, remember to always, always give the glory to God. It has been great seeing you all this week. And I hope that you find ways this week to put others first, to serve, to sacrifice, and to give glory to God.